Hi, my name is Philippa, and it's really great to welcome you to EBC Online. Today, we've got the third and final part in our series, Eternal. And Rob is going to be coming a little bit later to talk about perspectives on suffering. Now, Rob is, just as a precaution, having to isolate today. So his video, his talk, is going to come from his study. Uh, but I can guarantee it will still be as good as if he was standing here with us. But before he does that, we are going to sing a song. So the words are going to come up on the screen. It would be really great if you could join in.
Thanks, Phil. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome from me. This morning is the third in the series, which we have called Eternal. And in this series, we're considering the eternal essence of God. Two weeks ago, Simon talked about how our eternal God formed the universe in the beginning. And last week, Tom considered how God's eternal love has power over all things, even death. If you missed either of these excellent talks, then please go to the EBC website and catch up with them there. You certainly won't reg regret investing your time by listening to them. So this week, I'm going to be reflecting on God's eternal perspective on suffering. Now, about 25 years ago, I took part in an interdepartmental football match in which I was playing in goal. Yeah, I know. Just accept it. I really was playing in goal. And as the ball came into the penalty area from a corner, I ran out to catch the ball. I leapt up high and went right over the shoulder of an incoming forward. And although I landed upside down on my shoulder, I didn't break my collarbone, as onlookers suspected I had. But I did crack two ribs. Honestly, the pain was excruciating. I suffered and I was really feeling sorry for myself. However, in the weeks to come, whenever I related this story to women who were mothers, they would almost always respond with a comment that went something like this. If you think that's painful, mate, you want to try having a baby. And that's when I began to realise that there were indeed different perspectives on suffering. Now, my cracked ribs, I've got to be honest, they're the full extent of my direct personal experience of physical suffering. It's true, I do have some personal experience of emotional suffering through grief, but I have no direct personal experience of mental suffering, though I do have close friends and family who do. I guess that we all have had or some experience of suffering, either directly or indirectly through family and friends, let alone what we hear and read about in the news. Our experience and knowledge is different and varied for each of us. And sadly, the truth is, some people seem to have more than their fair share. But why is there any suffering at all in the world if God is all loving and all powerful as Christians claim he is? In fact, it is this very question that atheists pose to validate their assertion that God does not exist. They'll say something like this. 1. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, he would not allow suffering to exist. 2. Suffering does exist. Therefore, 3. God does not exist. Now this reason, this reasoning is, well, it, of course it's incorrect, it's flawed. Just because we human beings can't see or even imagine a good reason why God might allow something to happen doesn't mean there can't be one. If our minds can plumb the depths of the universe for good answers to suffering, well, then we say, well, there can't be any. Well, that's what we think. However, once we grasp that God is all-knowing and eternal, we can at least begin to understand and accept that God's perspective is vastly different and greater than ours. I'll give you an example. and I think this helps uh, with the concept of how perspective can distort our opinion and our reaction. If I say to you, now, I'm going to relate a story to you in which a child is caused to suffer because an adult deliberately does something that causes that child pain. How might you react toward that adult's behaviour? Do you know, I hope that we would all be troubled by the mere suggestion of an adult causing pain to a child. However, if I tell you that the child has a rotten tooth and the adult is a dentist, you now have a completely different perspective on what's happening. 
You see, when we have a bigger, different perspective, it's much easier, though I don't ever say easy, to understand suffering. There are numerous examples of God's unchanging and eternal perspective in the Bible. I've chosen just a couple of, to illustrate this morning. The first is the story of Joseph's life, which is found in the very first book of the Bible, which is called Genesis. And in Genesis chapters 37 through to 50, we, we can read about the life of Joseph. Now, I haven't got time this morning to go through it in detail, but I want to really encourage you to do just that if you want a better understanding of suffering and God's perspective. In brief then, Joseph is the favoured son of Jacob, but his brothers decide to get rid of him by selling him into slavery in Egypt. He is bought by a very wealthy man called Potiphar and he's eventually put in charge of his whole household. He's the, he's the second most important man after Potiphar. However, when he is falsely accused of sexual misconduct by Potiphar's wife, he's thrown into prison. And then, through the interpretation of dreams, he comes to the notice of Pharaoh and he's eventually put in charge of the whole land. Now, let's notice here that his life is just like ours. It's full of highs and lows. However, even in the low periods when he was suffering greatly, he never ever lost hope or his faith in God. Now, following this appointment by Pharaoh, <coughs> excuse me, and through more dreams, he realises that there is going to be a famine. So he prepares the country to withstand it. Those in other countries adjacent to Egypt also suffer from the famine and they come to Egypt seeking food, including his brothers. And when they realise exactly who Joseph is, his brother, uh, given what they did to him when he was much younger, they of course are afraid. But Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50 verses 19 to 21, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended harm for me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many, many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph saw that God had used the evil deeds of his brothers and others to bring him into a position where he could save the people from famine. And he understood that God has an eternal, infinite perspective. And, all, and that was clearly at work here. And so, despite all the suffering he had been through because of the evil done to him, he was able to see God at work and so to be reconciled with his brothers as well as blessing them. The second example I have for you of God's infinite and eternal perspective is, of course, the greatest of all. Imagine that you were one of Jesus' followers standing at the foot of the cross, watching Jesus suffer and going through the excruciating death of crucifixion. You'd probably be thinking, how could an all-powerful and an all-loving God allow this? Because your limited perspective will be unable to cope with it, even though Jesus had previously spoken about it, and that's recorded in John's account of his life, chapter 16, verses 19 to 22. Jesus realised they wanted to ask him about it. So he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said, in a little while, you won't see me. But in a little while after that, you will see me again. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labour, 
When her child is born, though, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. Standing at the foot of the cross, even though Jesus' followers have been warned from a human perspective, they, they just couldn't possibly grasp the cosmic consequences of what was happening. They, they couldn't grasp that on the cross, Jesus endured a suffering beyond all human understanding. He bore the punishment for the sins of the whole world. None of us can comprehend that suffering. Though he was innocent, he voluntarily underwent incomprehensible suffering for us. Why? Because he loves us so much. It's the only possible explanation. As followers of Jesus, when God asks us to undergo suffering that seems unmerited, pointless, unnecessary, thinking deeply and praying, meditate about the cross of Christ can help to give us the strength and the courage needed to bear the cross that we are asked to carry. And meditating upon the cross is something of which I do have direct personal experience. As Tom repeatedly said in his talk last week, God understands. And because of the cross, no one, no one can doubt that he understands about suffering. As I was lying in my bed the other night before going to sleep, these words came to me. The greatest suffering comes when hope departs. I want to say that again. The greatest suffering comes when hope departs. We all know, we can all sense that there is a deep, deep truth here. You see, if the atheist is right that God does not exist, then we're locked without hope in a world filled with pointless and unredeemed suffering. However, the Christian belief is that God does exist. And because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have this certain hope one day. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And I'm sure we'd all say amen to that. Let's pray. Lord God, in a world that is rapidly changing, we, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are a never, never changing saviour. And because you know the end from the beginning, you have an infinite and eternal perspective. Please develop in us an unwavering trust in the hope that you have given us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We choose again today to fix our eyes, not on the suffering and evil that surrounds us, but on you alone, our rock and our Saviour. Amen. Amen. So we're going to end our service now with two beautiful songs with wonderful words in them, which I would encourage you to really, really think about and uh, contemplate and meditate on. Yes, why not? The first one is Faithful One, and then that's going to be followed by This I Believe.
Through your Holy Spirit, conceive in Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever seen at high i believe in god our father i believe in christ the son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. Bye. 
thank you for joining us today. Next week, Steph, our minister, is going to be starting a series of one-off services. And she's going to be thinking about how to be church when you can't do church. And she's going to be thinking about some of the things we can learn from the persecuted church around the world. So it would be really great if you could join us then. But until then, stay safe, stay alert, and we'll see you very soon.